Uh, I've been trying to get Dave Gibbons here for a number of years. He's a very, very busy individual, and finally this year he found time in his schedule, so we're delighted to have him here. Dave intersects with many of the cities of the world, with those on the fringe, the poor, the misfits, the artists, students, business executives, community development specialists, and church leaders. He is the CEO of Yangdang.com, a new cause-driven east-west social movement. He is the lead pastor of New Song Global Alliance, which catalyzes churches with multiple forms and styles in third culture communities in Irvine, Los Angeles, London, Mexico City, Dallas, Seoul, and Bangkok, the average age all of which is 27. Dave serves on the board of World Vision U.S. and is also the CVO, CVO of Zealot, a community development organization that cultivates leaders of movements. Dave received his Master of Theology degree right here from Dallas Seminary in 1989. He also graduated from Max Dupree's Roundtable of Leaders, of which he was one of 12 leaders selected from across the country to participate in that training. He's married to Rebecca. And they have four children, Lee, Karis, Luke, and Megan. Let's welcome David back to our campus. You're probably wondering who Dave Gibbons is. When you look at my face, you go, what? <laughs> uh, my father's white, actually. He has blue eyes. And uh, my mom's Korean, five foot tall. And as you look at me, you can tell Koreans have some pretty strong genes. <laughs> it's great to be back home. And uh, this place, I, I'll never forget. When people ask me who influenced you, I, I, there's too many of the professors here that impacted my life. And uh, many of you men and women that I connected with, whether, whether it was in Hebrew or Greek or spiritual life class or Bible study methods, whatever it was, uh, there's things that were said and uh, that were rooted in my soul that have actually helped navigate some of the direction I've taken. And one of the things I appreciate most about this school is how you focus on leadership development. I felt like uh, when you looked at me and you looked at the students, you felt that we could change the world. And so thank you for that blessing that you gave me about 20 years ago. I just got back from the Chicago area, and I work with a lot of finance people. And uh, one of the things I started was a company called Misfits, and we trade commodities, the, uh, the, especially the grain markets, as well as the NYMEX. And we saw the, the market meltdown occurring probably three to five years ago. So we forecasted that. So we traded uh, in lieu of that. Well, when the market crashed, you know, of course, uh, everybody here in America was in disarray, and people are still in shock. Uh, your 401ks have now turned into 201ks. <laughs> um, but uh, there's something bigger maybe to think about, because you know, time will pass, whether it's another 10 years when America gets back on its feet, uh, we don't really know. But there's some significant moments I think we have to consider over the past 10 years. I want you to think of 911. If people say 911 didn't impact America, I think they're foolish. Uh, 911 was probably the, the, one of the most metaphorical harbingers of our time. When you look at the buildings that were destroyed, and I'm not trying to be prophetic in any ways, uh, but just as from an analysis, an interesting point, the two buildings that were destroyed were the Pentagon as well as the World Trade Center. And one is, uh, has to do with the center of finance, and the other has to deal with our military might. And if you look at the current milieu uh, in terms of America's global posture, we've gone down in the finance area, where if you talk to the finance people, and I've talked to a lot of them, they tell you America used to be optimistic. It's not so anymore. In fact, Europe and Asia and South America and Latin America, they're the ones leading in optimism. In fact, the market move yesterday was a result of the European market leading, not the American market. When you look at the area of military might, um, has America grown stronger? I don't know. If you look at what happened uh, with Iraq, I think there's a lot of struggle that's uh, occurred. And 
Uh, if you talk to American uh, military strategists, they tell you that we probably should be in Afghanistan right now. And we don't have right now the resolve, nor the will maybe to go there. And some would say the resources. So there's been a shift that's happened. Did you notice it? When you're here in seminary, you can put your head in the books, but what they taught us here was also to look at the newspaper, or now the internet, and to be in tune with the culture. I think one of the most vital things that you have to be in tune with is the cultural shifts that are now happening. There's a need for us, I believe, as the next generation of leaders to really focus on what I call the art of adaptation and what we've coined as third culture. And third culture is the mindset and will to love, learn, and serve in any culture, even in the midst of pain and discomfort. If you'd like to look at a website I put up, I put up a video of this guy that was nominated for an Emmy, and he did a piece on third culture. It's threeculture.tv. You can check it out. It's just the number threeculture.tv. Now, when it comes to adaptation, one of my favorite persons that I like to look to that, that, that helps me to understand it is another hero of mine, and it's the famous Bruce Lee, all right? <laughs> he, was, he was asked a question. Um, what type of martial arts do you do? Okay, let's look at his response. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. Don't you love that? Be water, my friend. He says you have to be water. And it sounds kind of new agey, right? You listen to that, you go, ah, there's some tones there. I'm not sure about. But I want you to think about Jesus. Jesus became water. When he was with the Samaritan woman, he says, I'm going to give you water, and you're never going to thirst again. Jesus became water in John chapter 1, where the Son of God became human flesh so that we could touch experience him. You see, this whole issue of adaptation and third culture is not really anything new, it's just new language. What you have is contextualization, or some would call incarnational ministry in other generations. But this is the art that we have to be about, adaptation. So with that in mind, I'd like to point to several things uh, today, maybe some reflections I've had in my past 20 plus years of ministry as I've traveled around the world, some things I thought maybe would help you as students as you endeavor to be leaders for this next generation. I want to start off with a personal confession. And the confession is that when I uh, came and grew out of the seminary, my ambition was to impact the world. And that's pretty large. And it's also to make a difference or to influence the world. And so with that model, you want to grow, and this is the premise I had, the bigger our, my church could be, the more influential I could be in the city and possibly in the world. I'm not sure if I believe that anymore. We're about to start this building campaign uh, in, in Southern California. And this was going to be about a 50 to $75 million project right off the Interstate 5. This would be a showcase piece of property if we were to obtain it. We were in the final bidding of this property when a famous Korean company outbid us named Kia. And Kia built their headquarters there. They said to us and to the Irvine company, whatever you bid, we're going to give you or pay $1 million more. So we weren't able to combat that, so we just gave it up. But I remember something during that time of the campaign. Um, you get these kits, right? As you guys get older, you'll find these fundraising kits. And uh, you can meet consultants that can teach you how to raise money for your buildings. And so one of the kits I read was, um, you need to say, it's not about the building, it's about what happens inside the building. I go, man, that's a good line. <laughs> Man, that's going to bring in some money, and it did bring in some money, right? And so anyways, you know, uh, when we didn't get the property, we had all this money, and I was just sitting there, and I was thinking, well, I said that phrase, it's not about the building, it's about what happens inside the building, but then why was I feeling such remorse and depression? Because maybe it was a part of me. 
it was a desire that I had a building that could be a showcase building on Interstate 5 or on the side of Interstate 5. The Lord started working with me and said, Dave, you need to really take a look at your heart. And so I took a time out with my family uh, for my children. Two were in high school, one middle school, one elementary. And we actually went to Bangkok. Um, and it was to be a sabbatical, but we actually launched a church during the sabbatical. It was fun. And because uh, it was just fun. And we had such a great time launching this site. And uh, while we were there in um, Thailand, God just started speaking to me uh, through the word and through different scenarios. In the East, as you travel, you find that the spiritual stuff is a lot more overt. Here in America, things are often hidden, uh, even though there's as much intensity spiritually. Uh, in the East, uh, people are more, a lot more forthright with demons and angels and that, spirits and that type of thing. While I was there, we, we saw all types of crazy stuff. But the mo most important thing was, I think God went do some crazy things with me. And he started to unpack some things. And here's what he's unpacked. The first thing I learned was the power of one. You see, there's a shift going on from the big to the small or to the midsize. As you guys go on and want to start churches and do ministries, you're going to think about big. And you're going to be disappointed maybe if your church is not 2,000 or 5,000 people. You'll be disappointed maybe if you're not reaching hundreds of thousands of people. Well, I want you to reconsider this. When you think about Jesus, he often was about the small, the mustard seed, the individual that he'd meet on a side of a road, someone outside a wall, someone on the fringe like a Rahab. You see, Jesus is often about the one. I was uh, doing the, the church launch and doing the typical church planning model of preview services and getting things ramped up. And they said when we had our first preview, this is one of the biggest they've ever seen uh, in Bangkok. We had missionaries there that had been there for 20 years. Well, we had one service in this pub, and this, uh, after the service, uh, this man came walking up that was somewhat balding. And he had two kids and a, a wife, and they were, he got a stroller, and he came up to me and said, man, that was a great service. And, uh, you know, I just became a Christian. He said, would you mind uh, discipling me? I said, man, it'd be my honor. You know what I found out? This guy's name was Boyd Kosiobong. He is the most famous entertainer in Southeast Asia. In Thailand alone, there are 61 million people. 90% of the people know his name. When he holds a concert or throws one, it goes anywhere from 25 to 50,000 people. He has the ear of the king of Thailand. He has the ear of the most powerful financial family from Thailand called, uh, they own a company called CP. It's the largest foreign investor in China. You know what the Lord told me? He says, David, go ahead. Build your little church of 3,000 here. I got one man that can impact millions of people. It ruined my paradigm. <laughs> the power of one. It may not be for you the big, because there's not too many Bill Hybels or Rick Warrens. But maybe you can impact one that can actually influence millions of people around the world. What's your metrics of success? There's a shift from big to the small or to the midsize. There's a second shift that's going on. It has to do with the shift of focus. Uh, I've had the opportunity to talk to a wonderful man by the name of Bob Beal, who's a consultant, and a lot of you probably know him. He consulted, you know, Dobson with a Focus on the Family and Bill Bright when he was alive. And he still consults a lot of executive leaders, uh, both in the Christian and finance world. Well, one thing he helped me with a lot was he said, David, you have to be focused as you grow older. You just get more and more focused. He calls it like the 70-30 rule. He says, what's your 70% and what's your 30%? What's the one thing you're going to do excellently? And the other thing that you have to just be honest about, it's going to be mediocre. And if you try to make that second thing excellent, he said, you may burn out. You may get real tired. It may not be as good. So just be honest about your work. He says, what's your 70? So I thought and analyzed that in regard to church ministry. And I said, my 70 was probably Sunday mornings. Right? The Sunday mornings. And so you put a lot of emphasis on your preaching and teaching and also the programs there because we're judged and, and um, critiqued by what we do on Sunday morning. But then uh, what's the secondary thing? Well, it was leadership development. The more I thought about that, the more I said, 
that's also screwed up. I, I'm supposed to be a pastor who's an equipper. In other words, in our modern day language, language it'd be, I'm a support team member. Our laity are the field team. My role is to catalyze and inspire and give tools to the laity to do the ministry. That's gotta be my focus. But that wasn't my focus. Because again, I was in this whole church growth driven model, which I think consumed me for a while. So as you can see, I had to put on some new type of clothes. There's some new clothes that, uh, you know, again, when you're going through ministry, you'll find uh, there's some times when you just don't have enough moments for reflection. But if you can take some time out, whether it's a weekend or a month or a year, you'll notice some of your own addictions and, and uh, obsessions. And if you're not careful, they're going to veer you off course. And so I felt God saying to me, just like he said to David, he said, uh, these aren't your armor to wear. This worked for previous generations, but you're to wear and use a new set of tools. So what are the new set of tools? What are the new set of clothes? Here's another idea. It has to do with nomenclature, okay? There's a shift in nomenclature. You see, it's the task of every generation to create new language. You see, Bill Hybels and Rick Warren, everybody likes to bash these guys, uh, but they're great men of God. I've met both of them, I know them, and they really love the Lord. And who's the bash? A work of God, seriously. And so while I talk about the church growth thing, I, you know, I, I'm not diminishing the importance of it and, the, and how these men were brilliant and the women in part of this movement were, were phenomenal. But what I'm saying is that each generation has to consider their own language. You see, Bill and Rick, they created a business language to reach the businessmen who were the seeker, seekers for their generation. What's the language you're to create for your generation? You see, the language they used in the past was, it's all about the weekend. And I know one of our biggest churches in America, they have that on the staff walls. It's all about the weekend, stupid. I know another conference that you go to, they say, we want that one hour on Sunday morning for your children to be the very best hour of the week. Do you think as a parent you may argue with that? You see, we just have to maybe rethink and reimagine what we're saying. We can't just wear the same clothes or use the same language our parents did. And it's not to, again, dishonor the past, because you know I'm Asian. I'm all about honoring the past. <laughs> In fact, I believe what the Jewish rabbi says, you know, he who forgets the past is not fit to be a pioneer. We have to honor the past. But you're called as a new generation to put on a new set of lens. What's the language of your generation? This is the very thing you would do as missiologists. This is what you would do when you go to a different country. And right now, even in the city of Dallas, you have multiple cultures, subcultures. You have to think of the language of that generation and put on the skin of that generation. So there's a new language shift. The other shift that I think is happening is a shift, and I'll close with this, is this shift of uh, how we define neighbor. There's a redefinition of neighbor. And this is probably the most significant one to me. If you read the book, Purpose Driven Church, um, the two main premises that are built upon Jesus' mandates is loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and then secondarily loving your neighbor as yourself. Um, these two commandments are synonymous with one another if you study it. They're like one coin, just two different sides. You go, where do you get that? Well, it says in 1 John, if you can't love a brother who you can see, how do you love God who you don't see, right? So to me, those are kind of tied together. If you love the least of these, you're loving me. All right, so they're kind of intertwined. So if you're not really loving your neighbor, uh, maybe we can call it a question whether you're loving God. If you really love God, you're gonna love your neighbor. Just, they go together. Now the big issue for our day in the 21st century is who is our neighbor? Well, if you study you know, McGavran, who is an incredible missiologist, he'd say the neighbor, <laughs> is actually someone not like you, I believe. You see, what was done by McGavern is that uh, people say he created this homogeneous principle, and so meaning that likes attract, and so then the church growth movement took that and said, we need to create a demographic to target 
And if we target this demographic, our churches will grow. Again, the bigger premise, hopefully, was we can make impact or we can influence the city or the world. So let's target and grow big and reach, the, and reach this population. Now, there's a little problem. When Jesus was asked who my neighbor is, what did he say? You know, he's, he was very Eastern in his response. He actually told a narrative. And if you know Asian culture and Eastern culture, uh, oftentimes when they're didactic, they don't tell you directly. It's not like a Jerry Springer thing where we're just gonna go right for the gut, you know, <laughs> and get raw and dirty. It's not gonna be about that. Um, what it is simply is uh, typically Asians have an issue, or Easterners, this is the issue, let's say. They will orbit it, and they'll nuance it. So they won't tell you directly no, all right? So if you ask them, hey, let's go to a party, oh, all right, you know they didn't really mean it, okay? <laughs> You have to be able to catch the nuance because it's a shame-based culture. We don't want to shame you by telling no to your face, nor do we want to shame your intelligence because you can figure it out. So Jesus has simply told a story. What story did he tell? The Good Samaritan story. A Creole person, half Jew, half Gentile, loving a Jew. I don't know if the Jews would like that story because you had an outsider, someone who they think is on the fringe that's marginalized, actually loving on him, become the hero of the story. Who's the neighbor then? Someone not like you. Can we take it deeper? Someone that you would hate. Can we take it deeper? Someone that you're unwilling to forgive. You see, is it really supernatural for you to love someone like you? Those who don't know Jesus can do that. You see, what's remarkable is if you can love someone not like you who's actually hurt you. That's a beautiful thing about Miroslav Volf's book, you know, Exclusion and Embrace. He talks about loving the other. Someone not like you. You know, I thought about Judas when I was there in Bangkok. I don't know what happened. I was on a BTS, the Bangkok transit system or something, but just thinking about Judas. And just thinking about, you know, why in the world did Judas, uh, why Jesus include Judas as part of the inner circle? And then I thought about that. I said, well, maybe that could be called the Judas principle. Maybe Jesus went to show the world how far his love could extend. You see, that goes beyond just culture. It goes, be, it goes to the deepest part of relational glue that really helps uh, build a society, which, are, which really is the bonds of governance of any community around the world. There's a book called Purple Cow by Seth Godin, and I encourage you to check it out sometime. It's an older book. Um, he's written a new book called Tribes. But check out Seth Godin's book, and uh, he talks about his journey into Europe. And when he was in Europe, he said he, he saw these cows, these dairy cows. And he says, at first, he goes, wow, these are cool. And so his, his kids thought it was cool, so they took pictures of these cows. But then he said, so, you know, after a while, there are these dairy-type cows all over the hillside. They got boring. And he said, uh, it got to the point we didn't even notice the cows. But then he said, what if there was a purple cow? He goes, we get out of the car, and we take pictures of that, and we stay a while to look at that purple cow. He said that purple cow would truly be remarkable, and he defined remarkable as something you would remark about. <laughs> What's the purple cow of the church? It's when you can love the other, when you can adapt and love the people on the fringe because you're gonna find something really unique about Jesus and his way. It's contrarian, it's paradoxical. You wanna reach the mass, you have to reach the marginalized. You wanna reach the powerful, you gotta become poor. You see, the key to the city, when the spies went to enter the city, was Rahab, a person again on the fringe. 
I remind you of, the, of Rodney Stark, a historian that's often controversial. He's written a book called The Rise of Christianity. In this work, he, was, he pondered the question, how did the Christian church grow so quickly in the first and second century? And he said that there were the, there was these great pandemics that would overwhelm a city. And he said that the healthy people would all leave and leaving the, leave the sick people there to die. You know who else would stay? A little group of people called Christians. Jesus followers. Talk about viral. That changed the world. Father, I pray right now you'd help us to see through the illusions of our own heart and also the illusions of cultures that are created even within Christendom. And Father, help us to see what you see. Help us not to get caught up with just the metrics of man, but help us to be in tune with your heart. I pray for each person in this room, you give them eyes to see, you give them ears to hear, you give them a heart that's passionate and bold. May they sense your anointing and favor as the next generation of leaders in the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.